can keep it like that. Uh, looking forward for um, upcoming event, um, as everybody can capture the screen, uh, next meeting on this month will be about lung cancer and in October we will have uh, also you know, lung cancer and uh, throughout um, till end of December we have uh, every, um, uh, two, um, every two weeks we will have a meeting. So upcoming meeting, uh, see if save the date for the Precision Oncology Summit will be 16 and 17 of October. And we will thank Lily uh, for sponsoring the, this meeting and all our meeting. Uh, thank you, Lily, uh, for participation. So without any further delay, I'll ask Dr. Abdullah Sherm to start uh, the presentation. And the other speaker uh, will go after Dr. Abdullah Sherm. Um, I think we did the introduction. And um, I'll be um, moderating if, any, um, if you need me, just call for my name. Thank you. Abdullah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashwag. Thank you so much, Prof. Jazia, for this excellent initiative, and it's our pleasure. However, Ashwag and Prof. Jazia, I see more of lung cancer. Remember, we have a GI, and remember, we have a dead neck, please. This is a very excellent idea, and we would like to extend it to all uh, tumor sites. Uh, special thank for the audience, special thank for uh, Lily for their uh, support. So uh, I was asked to uh, find a case with a difficult and challenging. And a matter of fact, there is nothing more difficult than bladder cancer among all cancer in the GU. As you can see, the improvement on the developmental of uh, medication in terms of uh, in prostate cancer and kidney cancer and the bladder cancer, there is a tremendous improvement in terms of the medications availability and indications in the prostate cancer and the kidney cancer. And you can imagine a bladder cancer since 1980 till 2016. We did not have any changing practice. So for almost 35 and 40 years, we don't have any new medications. In addition of this, if you see the survival uh, for a 10 years comparison in terms of in 1990 to 2000 and 2000 to 2010, it's almost identical. There was no change by any mean in terms of the survival. And this is the only tumor I can remember uh, plus uh, pancreatic cancer showed this typical care in terms of the survival. So there is no questions about metastatic carcinomas and met need in our clinic. And this is actually based on the pathology of transitions as carcinoma. But what about the rare uh, entity of this uh, type of uh, cancers? So let's discuss this case of, uh, we saw it in 24 of October, 2016, 29 years old male who present to our clinic with hematuria. He underwent for Cytoscopy and TRPT and pathology confirmed muscle invasive adenocarcinoma of the urinary bladders. So the two striking thing, number one, he's a 29 years old, he's a very young, and number two, he developed invasive adenocarcinoma of urinary bladder, as you can see in the CT scan. So the first question to the audience, do we need to do the abdominal X-ray? I don't know, Ashwag, if there is any voting here. Ashwag, do you, do you hear? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, Mohammed, yes. do we have voting? I think uh, we don't have the question in advance, so I okay, think we don't very, have very, voting right now. Okay. So the question, do we need to do abdominal x-ray? I think Dr. Bassam Basleman is going to answer. And can we differentiate it between adenocarcinoma of the bladder origins and metastatic from the colon cancer? We know colon cancer is a very common in Saudi Arabia. It's number one in male patients. And is there any way to differentiate between adenocarcinoma of the bladder and adenocarcinoma of the colon? And we'll hear this from Dr. Amin Rahman. So scan showed there is no evidence of metastatic disease. What is the most appropriate therapy? Shall we go with upfront surgery, then consider adjuvant therapy? Shall we go with the chemo radiation therapy, then surgical resection? Shall we go with the chemotherapy, then surgical resection? or shall we go with a radical chemo radiation therapy? And if there is anyone from uh, Nanking Fahad Medical City, a consultant 
and you would like to answer these questions, do you know Dr. Amina Tijani with us now, or Dr. Mohamed Al Ghandi, or Dr. Faisal Adam? So, uh, all these four options, it is uh, very possible, and we'll discuss this later on with Dr. Bassam and Dr. Uh, Nadim. And if we choose what's the best systemic therapy that we could use, shall we go with the full box chemotherapy, deal with it as an adenocarcinoma of the colon, or shall we go with the, what we know, Jim's platinum chemotherapy, or because of the vi because of adenocarcinoma, shall we go with the mitomycin and vive view, or shall we go with the traditional chemotherapy that we use frequently in transition cyst carcinoma? the MVAC chemotherapy. And again, we are going to hear about the huge controversy about what the best systemic therapy in this uh, patient. So basically patient uh, went for upfront surgery and pathology confirmed well differentiated adenocarcinoma. It was invade the perivesical tissue with four out of 14 lymph nodes were positive. The section margin was completely negative and final pathology T3 into M0. Remember, this is adenocarcinoma. It is, non -trans it is not transitional cyst carcinoma, which would like usually to approach with a new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgical uh, approach. So in this patient, we, are go, uh, we go up front with surgical resections. So what we should do, here's a T3 into M0 disease, just observe. Shall we go adjuvant chemotherapy with the full fox based, or shall we go with adjuvant chemotherapy with gymsis platinum, as we are doing usually with this transition cyst carcinoma? Or shall we go with the consideration of chemo radiation therapy? And for this patient, actually, we elect to uh, go with eight cycle of full fox chemotherapy, and he it last was in 5th of April, 2000. 17, subsequently he was started on active surveillance. So on 11 of July, 2017, so you can see a patient has metastatic deposit in lung and in the liver and also in the paraortic area. So you can imagine how the short period when we stop the medications from 5 of April, 2017 till 11 of July, so we are speaking about almost two months or three months uh, when patient developed uh, metastatic disease. So what we should do? Shall we go with the full Fox chemotherapy because we hold it? Shall we go again with Jim, this platinum chemotherapy? Shall we go with the full fairy chemotherapy? Shall we go with the MVAC chemotherapy? And definitely patient was started in Jim, this platinum. However, here's Okay, start my video. Okay. So patient was started on gym cytopene and cisplatinum chemotherapy. Uh, initially he was uh, showed stable disease, subsequently it showed disease progressions. So at this stage, what we should do? It is challenge with the full Vox chemotherapy, chemotherapy with Volveri, chemotherapy with MVAC, or shall we go with the standard second line chemotherapy at that time, which is taxane. So patient was started on uh, chemotherapy and subsequently he received four cycle of uh, pulveric chemotherapy and he has progressed after nine cycle exactly uh, of therapy with a performance status, as you can see, multiple liver and lung metastasis. So the question for the audience, and we'll discuss this later on, is the immunotherapy option for patient with adenocarcinoma? Definitely in transition cyst carcinoma, it has a big role. But what the big question, what about the adenocarcinoma? I think with this, Dr. Ashwag, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abdullah. I, wa I, I was hoping there was a voting, but anyway, we... Yeah, because we don't have the question in advance. Thank you, Abdullah. So um, we'll ask um, our uh, pathologist, um, the, he, he gonna discuss uh, the pathological finding. Dr. Mohammed. Dr. Mohammed, he's with us. Dr. Amina Rahman. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, sorry, is he with us? Not yet, doctor, not yet. Not yet? No. Okay, uh, maybe we'll close the, um, the second time. If we can... He's, Jason, I cannot hear, is he around? So no, no, doctor, no, 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 he's not, he's not yet around. Dr. Uh, Abdullah said he will be a bit late, but he's not yet around. Okay, let's go to the third speaker um, um, for uh, the medical oncology, Dr. Nadim. He will discuss uh, the medical oncology point of view. Dr. Nadim? Um, sorry to be Dr. Bassam is the medical oncologist. So if he oh, wants to start, yes, and I'll take over after him. Sorry, so Dr. Bassam, you're welcome to present uh, the medical oncology point of view. Assalamu alaikum. So my cloud, my slide is clear? Yeah, it's clear. Allah hayyik. Yeah, good. Yeah, Bismillah Rahim. I work in the beginning. Uh, to thank the organizing uh, committee to allow me to participate in this event. Uh, here we are presenting, uh, as the presenter, Abdullah, adenocarcinoma of urinary bladder. Uh, it's an uh, answer to this. Uh, and the next slide will review uh, what medical oncology review. So, objective, I'd like to discuss presentation, diagnosis, optimal treatment patients with adenoma, and also recognize the emergency MUB and target uh, approaches to adenocarcinoma. Uh, here, the uh, diagram is the material that, uh, carcinoma representing of the cancers is up to 5%. Then in your is only 10 to 20 percent. And for our cancer today, carcinoma is representing 2 percent from all the blood cancer. Uh, the blood carcinoma X factor is infection, which uh, presented uh, will be up to 10 percent those with cystosome. Uh, other things remember and had uh, the search uh, the bladder we are argument also a risk factor. Uh, uh, presenting patient presenting uh, uh, the bladder adenoma have initially to for any other doctor Bassam excuse me uh, I think we cannot hear you in a good way can can you you know try to connect to another network Ah, uh, sure. So just. Uh, while we're connecting, uh, Dr. Bassam, uh, Abdullah, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Ashwag, yes. There is a question from the audience. Would you consider um, to do BDL1 test or tumor um, uh, burden? Yes. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is yeah, this is a question that, question I, that ask, I ask, ask the group, the group. And I would like to hear from them. I mean, there is no evidence by any means. So uh, it could be an option, definitely. Uh, but the patient gets performance that's very poor. And I'm sure Dr. Bassam Basleman is going to explore the option of immunotherapy in adenocarcinoma. There is no data, Dr. Ashwag, by any means. So if there is no data, is there any point to do the BDL1 test for this patient? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not sure about sure. this. Sure. Okay, uh, while we're waiting for Dr. Bassam uh, to really connect, uh, um, uh, let's have um, a little chat about uh, the, uh, the management, Abdullah. So mm -hmm. initially we were thinking of colon cancer, or it's not, it was not clear by the pathology, the primary? 
So, no, always, Dr. Ashwag. I mean, this, for this case, it was very clear because it is only bladder cancer. And the big question, Dr. Ashwag, if it's metastatic disease, you know, the colon cancer and rectal, it's almost nearby uh, the colon. Mm -hmm. And we don't know it's a primary or a metastatic disease. I mean, it's, it's usually they will find very hard to differentiate between the two. Uh, but in this case, it was very clear. It's bladder and the colon was completely normal. So, uh, but the problem with the metastatic disease, if there is, we have extensive metastatic disease with colon origins, and there is a bladder. So the question is, is it bladder origin or it's a colon origin? Excellent. Dr. Bassam, you're with us? Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, sorry uh, for that. No, the mic is yours. Allah hayyik. Yeah. So, uh, once you have a bit diagnosed with blood carcinoma, Initially, we have rule at the other side, uh, other the primary side. Uh, we have to refer the patient to do CT scan and uh, refer the patient to gastroenterology to do to, to rule out the source like cancer or cancer that has metastasis to the bladder, and it looked like uh, like primary bladder cancer. I think it has to be ruled out. So it, we have to distinguish from adenocarcinoma that the flop. Uh, that can be developed archived remnant, which usually show as, as a less aggressive behavior and probable prognosis. Uh, and could be treated bladder preserving technique, typically in male, older age, uh, and present at, at, at advantage. Is my voice Yes, Dr. Um, but Sam, I cannot, يعني, the slide is freezing on the risk factor. I, we cannot see the, 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 the other. Are you flipping the slides? Uh, no, yeah, I flip it now. Yes. But my voice is clear. Um, Mohammed, let me ask Mohammed. This is technical. Mohammed, do we I have th the thing? Uh, I, I think, I think it is still disconnecting every once in a while. Okay. But it's a little bit better than the before. Than before. What about voting? There is uh, voting for the questions. Uh, no, unfortunately, we did not have the questions in advance to this presentation, so we did not prepare them. Okay, Mana Abbasam, you can carry on and discuss the different option, the various option for the audience. Yeah, but but okay. my voice is not that clear. Yeah, your voice is clear. Your voice is clear. Yeah. Uh, I would like to show a few slides on archal carcinoma. Uh, it is very rare. It is a care most young uh, patient. It is actually a physical rim that connects the home of the bladder uh, to the umbilical area. And uh, so technically speaking, it's really a bladder cancer, but the patient may present a bladder tumor as the mass rating through the bladder so when you see the dome, uh, the, the, the mass, uh, the tumor is in the dome, the midline, uh, this is very low risk of suspicion. We are facing uh, archal carcinoma. Uh, the characteristic of this uh, archal carcinoma, uh, its histology is in type. Uh, we, can, we are seeing here a uh, display. Uh, uh, and we have out a carcinoma uh, elsewhere. Staging here for carcinoma is different than the one for, uh, for other, uh, for urethral cancer. In urethral cancer, we are using the AGC staging. For archal carcinoma, we are using the building staging, uh, which is, uh, for example, the patient with hematuria, that means that yeah, the cancer is infiltrating the bladder. So once the cancer is extending to the bladder, here is the staging for uh, using Sheldon staging, it's stage three. And another staging, uh, we use it as Mayo Clinic. Uh, when filtrating the blood here, we call it HIST2. And this staging is mainly will help to consider prognostic, prognostic of the patient. Uh, after Abdullah Sharm at the beginning of the first question, uh, he needs an abdominal x ray. You for adenocarcinoma, abdominal x ray, we can see the mass with classification. Uh, and that helped uh, give us that we are dealing with adenocarcinoma. 
the CT scan uh, cross section, we can see us in the uh, just uh, at a dome, and the axial imaging, so we can see the muscular dome of the bladder. Uh, also, histopathology, we can see the urethelium is actually fairly well preserved. Uh, and we can see the mucin and the singetring cell. And the urethelium carcinoma marker typically negative. The GIT3 is negative here, so it's uh, uh, typical for archal carcinoma. Treatment wise, it's probably one of the, the only two invasive carcinoma we will see. Partial systemy is resorption. Lymph node dissect and very important M blocker of the whole arcus to the umbilical. We call it uh, umbilectomy. Uh, I think the role of new adjuvant therapy, we know in arterial, uh, arterial cancer, the state of care is going with new adjuvant therapy for cystic, for uh, radical cystic, for muscle invasive urethral cancer. But arcal carcinoma, the study show uh, there is a retrospective data that there is no real role for adjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. I think the local recurrence, after say around, around 15% in this two years, the risk of relapse will be higher for people who had positive node or positive surgical margin. Uh, for local advanced or metastatic arcal carcinoma, Typically, we are using splatin, five of you, or a combination. Uh, and this meta analysis that look at the bilinium and five of you. And especially for five of men, we can see here uh, it seems to be one that yield complete or and good parts response compared to the platinum based chemotherapy. So we can five of you based combination, platinum and five of you based had a good response. Back, so back now for bladder adenocarcinoma presentation in general. Uh, so usually, once we compare adenocarcinoma compared to urethral cancer, the urethral cancer transitional cell usually presenting it and at earlier as non muscle invasive. Uh, for adenocarcinoma, usually will uh, morally will locally advance at time of presentation. As one or T2, it's like it to be uh, uh, non muscle invasive. Regarding the prognosis, prognosis of local disease with adenocarcinoma of blood. For non muscle invasive, we can hear the care. The care is representing the urethral cancer, and uh, uh, the region is representing the adenocarcinoma. For non muscle invasive, we can clearly see uh, the adenocarcinoma had a worse survivor compared to the urethral cancer. Regarding muscle emphasis stage and lymph node assessing stage, you can see the black and red, the adenine and the urethral, almost for the same uh, prognosis. Also, metastatic uh, urethral cancer. Uh, the case black and red, you know, carcinoma, they are following. So, th there is no major difference between the Dino and the urethral on, on prognosis. Uh, is most clear. It, it can it be a message that the net is unstable, but I hope it is clear. To some level, yes, it's clear. Uh, Victor, you can proceed. Okay. Uh, regarding the radical uh, surgery, has historically in the treatment of adults, which result in long-term survival up to 40% of patients in five years. And, and we do the stage adjusted and adjusted cancer-specific mortality after radical cystic is similar to real carcinoma. So no different in the, in the survival uh, after the surgery between serial and adenocarcinoma. Now the question, uh, uh, is the rule for new and chemotherapy or different chemotherapy? Uh, we have retrospective data. The, the first one is assessing the, uh, the role of new and chemotherapy and the compare new adjuvant chemotherapy surgery versus surgery alone. Uh, and there's no difference in the, uh, in the survival, for our survival. 
also adjuvant chemotherapy. Once we compare uh, the patient who had tissue alone and by observation, or the receiving adjuvant therapy, they didn't have any uh, different death survival. So in terms of metastatic blood in carcinoma, like I said earlier, these tumors typically look like picture between urethral and adenocarcinoma of the colon. So we do from the colon care the option of 5 2 and uh, backbone of chemotherapy for blood urethral carcinoma is cisplatin. So, and this is its multiple uh, uh, studies report here in the literature about using of chemotherapy in adenocarcinoma, and we see here the end, uh, which is part of patient has reported, is, is really low. It's, uh, and it's important to note that when we are testing this patient, we have very little evidence, just because these are their tumor, and we have to conduct a clinical trial for them. So from this, uh, we see that the uh, 5 2 with cisplatin has been tried in multiple trials, uh, and the non-activity uh, reached around 33%. Uh, also, other regimen is MD Anderson regimen. Uh, it's called the GEMP lab, which includes GEMP FFU, and platin. And it also had bounce rate 35 to 40 percent. Awful Fox was right uh, with uh, uh, the case report and show a bar chart response. But we consider we comparing responses with uh, with urethral cancers uh, when when use platinum based chemotherapy, cisplatin, gemcitabine, or the MFAC regimen. The response with uh, with urethral cancer is reaching four. 65%, which is a higher compared to the adenocarcinoma response. Uh, one of the common, uh, usually using for uh, arterial cancer is, is cystic and gemcitabine. So the retrospective and metastatic and transitional carcinoma patient receive a first line chemotherapy with blood-based chemotherapy. While 14, 14 based of them was adenocarcinoma. And most of them, they receive cisplatin gemitabine. And you can see here the response is around uh, 35%. And survival is reached around 40. The median overall survival is 47 months. The only prospect trial testing the aneurethral and the transition cancer of the urethral trial uh, is trial, which is uh, uh, published 2006, which is the inclusion with metastatic adenocarcinoma or squam or sarcomatoid or fully differentiated carcinoma. Uh, they include around 20 patients. Uh, 11 out of 20 was ad uh, were adenocarcinoma. We did with the IT chemotherapy with bacitaxel, platin, and alphosomide for three weeks for a maximum of six months. The mean of the patient that they receive cycle and bones they are around 36 percent uh, which is almost the same as the previous regimen platinum base or the triplet regimen as the uh, cis flap here that we can see, uh, prospective trial the median survival is around four months with compared hair for is into 30 months, 32 months. Going to molecular profile. So we know about molecular profiling. So we know about data from cancer genome that promise regarding urethral carcinoma. So for adenocarcinoma, the studies are unfortunately few and far between, but we can see here, for instance, that high rate of RB2 and EFR, as well as element in multi-drug resistant the BCRP and the MRP. And this will explain why these tumors are particularly more consistent. This is another study showing that uh, uh, there's no significant EGFR mention event uh, or uh, arrangement were identified. For arcal uh, carcinoma, I want just to point here that this study shows a high association with MSI. 
uh, and remember the arcal carcinoma is uh, it's not blood cancer it's resembles uh, a colon cancer more also the genotype of ras biraf and ras is almost the same as what you are seeing in colon cancer the big expression is 16 percent in, in that study so uh, regarding target and immune therapy in bladder adenocarcinoma, similar to melanoma and non small cell lung cancer, bladder carcinoma tumor show a wide mutational spectrum that predict a good response rate in immune therapy. Unfortunately, there is a lack of knowledge of the molecular landscape of bladder adenocarcinoma. We have very limited data here. Uh, and for the evidence of, uh, on news, the immune therapy is limited. Therapy has a major role in treatment of urethelial carcinoma. Uh, DL1 and DBD1 antibodies approved for treatment of metastatic cancer up front in and uh, platinum ineligible or a failure of platinum based therapy. And this trial uh, was ex where excluded cases of urethelial cancer and variant, uh, variant urethelial bladder cancer. So the role of immune therapy in treatment of these patients is remain undefined. Here, I will, there is some, uh, uh, there is a lot of case report and case series. Uh, I, I would like, to, I want to just point one uh, out. Uh, I would like to point out this one, where there was a marked marked response in EGFR antibody with cetuximab, which one we are using in uh, colon cancer. So the patient had uh, a. a after chemotherapy, there is a six month post and response durable uh, for which is around eight months here with cetuximab, uh, which is resembling the current cancer here. Regarding the trial of immune therapy uh, for uh, adenocarcinoma, we have three or four trials, I'll pass by on it. So the first is SOL trial, which is a single arm safety study of atezolizumab for locally advanced uh, on aesthetic urethelial uh, or non-urethelial carcinoma of the urine trial. So this is the largest phase four trial of in bladder cancer. And they recruit around 1,000 patients. 48 patients were uh, non-urethelial cancer with mixed histology of bladder cancer. And and they include, uh, what, that includes what sequimus cell around 18 patients, glandra, which the endocarcinoma around eight patients here. And the results show that atezolizumab is safe and effective treatment for uterine carcinoma in for all histology. They didn't report the result for specific histologic adenocarcinoma of sequimus. Here, uh, a phase two trial. Uh, using the dual point inhibitor, uh, treated in non urethral bladder cancer in general. So they include all the non urethral bladder cancer, adenos, squamous, sarcomatoid, small cell. So, and they tested uh, the, the combination of nifolumab and ibrumab. Uh, and they include around three patients with adenocarcinoma and five patients with arcal carcinoma. And we can see the waterfall uh, plot. We exclude the other uh, histology, other adeno and arcal. You can see here that there are two patients had a response, one arcal and one adenocarcinoma. The brown one is the adeno, and the red one is the arcal carcinoma. And the other patient had, they have almost stable disease after median follow-up four months. Other trial was a phase one study. Uh, um, trying to uh, testing the combination of a checkpoint inhibitor and uh, targeted therapy with with nilumab and ibrumab. Uh, and they include a general array uh, urethelial cancer and it shows some efficacy, efficacy in the non-urethelial non bladder cancers. And we can see here four cases of urethelial cancer. So for, uh, th this was leading to a concept that uh, for creating a clinical trial called Alliance, who is uh, studying bilumumab, carotenib, and nipumab and rare urinary cancer. And one of these rare urinary cancer is the adenocarcinoma of the bladder. And they will roll the patient as a first line 
or a second line beyond uh, after the cellatin uh, chemotherapy failure. And the primary endpoint is for our survival. They are still recruiting patient. The other trial is the SWOG DART trial. Uh, it's a basket trial of dual anti CLA4 and anti BDL1 uh, blocket and hip tumor. Clay is also a current uh, patient and it's utilizing flumab and imumab, primary objective of overall survival. And one of the rare histology that's included in this trial is adenocarcinoma variant. So, Till now, we don't have an answer for uh, the, uh, any effect from immunotherapy in this uh, rare histology, till we have more clear evidence. So in summary, uh, adenocarcinoma blood are rare, and usually they diagnose at a advanced stage with specific characteristic and presentation. We have to rule, remember, to rule out a primary adenocarcinoma, colon, GI, prostate, or lung, no consensus guideline treatment of the adenocarcinoma. Radical cystectomy remained uh, the standard of care. No role of new adjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy. For metastatic, uh, triplet regimen combination of cisplatin or carboplatin, gypsentabine, and FACU or texane uh, is uh, a tor tor tolerable and effectuous. But still, uh, major durable response are rare, and all patients will be relapsed. Clinical trial is ongoing for the use of therapy and target therapy, uh, which could be an option for an uh, for eligible patient. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bassam. Um, I think all pathologists make it, he joined. Dr. Al, uh, Al yes, I'm, yes, I'm around. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, if you can share your slides. Yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, can you see that on the screen? Uh, not yet. Um, okay. Please, please, please make sure to select the right screen, Dr. Yes, now it is, it's loading. Yes, doctor, we can see it. Okay. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm sorry for, how, uh, for what happened. I think there was a problem with my mic. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Yes, we Okay, uh, good. Uh, okay, thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this forum, Dr. Abdullah, and uh, everybody else who's involved in hosting this. Uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about adenocarcinoma of the bladder. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the slides of this particular case Dr. Abdullah presented. So I'm just going to give a general talk on adenocarcinoma. Uh, the, my first slide is basically uh, showing the histopathology of uh, the normal histopathology of urinary tract, starting from renal calyx, ureter, pelvis, bladder, and all the way to urethra. And it is lined by transitional epithelium, which we also call urethelium. And this is a multi-layered, seven to nine layer in, in its normal uh, configuration, and which is very easily recognized. And there are variants of this uh, uh, histology. In this screen, you can see some downward invaginations of the urethelium, which we call von Braun's nests. And if these nests have some spaces within them, we call them cystitis cystica, and these are lined by uh, urethelial uh, cells or transitional epithelium. But once these these spaces are lined by columnar epithelium, like in this case, we call it uh, cystitis glandularis. And if they show intestinal uh, metaplasia, in, like in this case, in this picture, you can see a lot of goblet cells. This epithelium looks like, just like in duodenum or colon, small or large bowel, and we call this uh, cystitis glandularis with intestinal metaplasia. I'm showing you this because this is considered to be one of the possible precursors of adenocarcinoma of the bladder. And this one here is the squamous metaplasia. So there are multiple types of metaplasias which can happen in the bladder mucosa. And a lot of my data, I think, have already been discussed by Dr. Bassar. So it's just a repetition. Hope that's okay. As you all know, urethelial carcinoma is the most common type of bladder tumor. More than 90% of the tumors are urethelial type. 
And squamous carcinoma comprises of uh, roughly 5% of the cases, and adenocarcinoma is the rarest type, less than 2% or roughly 2% of all the bladder tumors. Uh, adenocarcinoma of the bladder comes under the uh, uh, general heading of glandular neoplasms of the bladder, which comprises of adenocarcinoma of non uracal type, uh, uracal type adenocarcinoma, and villus adenoma, which is a benign lesion. Uracal type adenocarcinoma actually, uh, can, uracal carcinoma in general can be of adenocarcinoma, the most common type, but it can also be of uh, other types like squamous or urothelial. Adenocarcinoma of the bladder, as I mentioned, is uh, one of the rare uh, types of uh, bladder cancer, roughly 2%. It's more common in males, uh, and the ratio is about 3 to 1, male to female. Uh, regarding causative agents, uh, it is thought that long-standing intestinal metaplasia, uh, especially which is uh, arising in bladder extrophy, which is a congenital uh, deformity, or any chronic irritation and obstruction, uh, long-standing non-functioning bladders, even schistosomiasis, which is most commonly, it gives rise to, gives rise to squamous cell carcinoma, can also give rise sometimes to adenocarcinoma. And it's, it is also thought that pelvic lipomatosis, which is basically uh, increased in fat around the bladder and the rectum, uh, uh, can also give rise to adenocarcinoma. And also it can arise from uracal remnants, in which case it is called uracal adenocarcinoma. Although any part of the urinary tract can be affected, uh, and can show adenocarcinoma, but bladder is the most common site in the urinary tract. Uh, adenocarcinoma of the bladder arises most commonly in the sixth uh, decade, and the most common site, as I mentioned, is bladder. And most commonly, patients will present with hematuria, but dysuria and mucosuria can also be a, a, a sign of early presentation. Histopathology wise, adenocarcinoma is recognized as purely, uh, or sorry, primarily of bladder region if there is no associated urothelial or squamous element in, this, in the carcinoma. If we have urothelial carcinoma and there are four of adenocarcinoma, we don't call it adenocarcinoma, we call it urothelial carcinoma with glandular differentiation. I will briefly discuss that in the end. And it's of two types, and, uh, enteric type, mucinous type, and then there's a third type which we call it mixed type. Enteric type, as the name suggests, uh, shows a typical uh, morphology as we see in colon or uh, small bowel. And mucinous types, also mucinous carcinoma, but with, with single cells or nest of uh, tumor cells floating in the uh, mucinous pool. And if we have both types of pathology or morphology in the tumor, we call it mixed type. This picture shows you uh, adding the carcinoma of enteric type, and it looks like just like any uh, intestinal carcinoma of a small or large bowel origin. You can see the glands are lined by pseudostratified hyperchromatic nuclei, uh, nuclei and they can show uh, central necrosis, which is common in, also common in colon. And in this picture here on the left, you can see nests of tumor cells floating in mucin pools. This, this, is also, this is a mucinous type. Another type of mucinous carcinoma is signet ring type, where you see individual cells showing signet ring cell morphology floating in mucin pool also. Regarding, uh, which is the most, the most challenging part of diagnosis uh, is distinguishing primary bladder versus metastatic adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma di diagnosis per se is not difficult. I mean, we can easily recognize it, uh, compare it with urothelial carcinoma, which is very, very easy. But the problem is to, to identify its primary origin, whether it's bladder or outside the bladder. The immunosequence we normally use uh, is CK7, CK20, CDX2, beta catenin and e cadherin GATA3 can also be used, but we don't have that in our, in our hospital. In this table, uh, there's a comparison of these immunostains between bladder and colorectal carcinoma. Uh, CK7 is, uh, it can be expressed in bladder sometimes, but can be negative or patchy. And colorectal carcinoma most of the time are negative for CK7, but lower uh, in erectile colorectal carcinoma can show CK7 positivity. CK20 can be positive in both, often is positive in both, so that's not really helpful. CDX2 similarly can be seen in both types of tumors, so this one also doesn't help. Beta catenin and ecaterin are very interesting. They show a uh, completely opposite uh, staining uh, pattern. Beta catenin in bladder tumors would show cytoplasmic and membranous staining. Uh, and no nuclear staining or very rare nuclear staining, whereas in colorectal carcinoma, a beta catenin would show nuclear staining in most cases. About 20% of the time, it, it is negative or doesn't show nuclear staining. Icadherin, on the other hand, would show cytoplasmic membranous plus nuclear staining in bladder tumors and cytoplasmic membranous only without nuclear staining in colorectal cancers. 
So if we have a tumor which is showing patchy CK7 positivity, CK20 positive, beta catenin cytoplasmic membranous, and E cadenin nuclear and cytoplasmic membranous, this is most likely than a bladder origin. And if the tumor is showing CK7 negative, CK20 positive, beta catenin nuclear, E cadenin cytoplasmic uh, passion, that would be consistent with colorectal primary. Uh, other, other types of prosthetic adenocarcinoma, metastasis to bladder, that's not very difficult. We can morphologically and also with PSA and PSAP, we can, we can distinguish that easily. And if, but on the, uh, on the other hand, if we have a case with CK7 negative, 20 positive, CDX2 positive, beta catenin cytoplasmic, E catenin also cytoplasmic membranous, then we are stuck. Then here, it's not really that helpful. So we can, in this case, we will say clinical radiological closure is very important. We are not sure. It may be bladder, maybe. Uh, a colorectal. So there are cases like this which, where, where, which become challenging. So metastatic uh, adenocarcinoma is more common uh, in bladder than the primary adenocarcinoma. And prostate to the bladder is more common than colorectal to the bladder. That's why clinical and radiological profile is, uh, or correlation is very important. Here in this uh, picture, uh, we can see, I don't know how clear it is on your screen. If you see closely, you'll see this tumor, the beta catenin is uh, uh, staining cytoplasmic and membranous part of the cell. And you can see small blo uh, these sorry, small pale blue dots. These are nuclei which are not stained. So there's no nuclear staining. On this picture, but the, uh, there are uh, beta catenin is, is staining the nuclei, these dark uh, circles here, and plus weakly cytoplasmic as well. So this is bladder and this is uh, colorectal. And icaterin here is showing nuclear as well as cytoplasmic membrane staining. That's membrane, that's weakly cytoplasmic, and these round things are nuclei. And E. cadenin in colorectal is opposite. You can see the empty nuclei, unstained nuclei, and cytoplasmic staining for E. cadenin. So this is how the immune staining pattern would look like. Uh, genetic profile, they say KRAS mutation can be detected in some of the bladder, but not, not all of them, and in cast numbers. And treatment and, uh, has been discussed uh, by Dr. Bassam. Radical cystectomy, plus minus H1 uh, chemo radiation. Uh, prognosis is uh, poor generally, five year up to 40, 40 to 50%. The, the best predictor is the stage. And the tumors with significant cells without mucin has the worst prognosis. For this cancer, you can see it, it looks like adenocarcinoma. It has a lot of empty, uh, empty granular spaces or especially some pink material. This is not adenocarcinoma of the bladder. This is urethral carcinoma. Actually, this, the whole picture is not there. There's abundant urethral carcinoma in the background with some foci showing uh, glandular uh, differentiation. So we call these kind of tumors urethral carcinoma with glandular differentiation. Uh, and this can be seen in about 18% of the urethral tumor of, of the bladder, most of enteric type. And prognostic significance of these foci or this type of tumor is not certain it seems that they do not really have uh, any negative prognostic uh, impact on the, team, uh, on, the, on the patient. But it's important to mention in pathology report because this part of the tumor can metastasize uh, in other, other locations, and then it becomes challenging to find the primary uh, origin. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Al Amin. Uh, I think we'll move um, to um, our second speaker, um, Dr. Nadim. Um, he will um, talk about um, the graduation oncology point of view. Dr. Nadim, are you there? Dr. Nadim? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So I'm trying to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Okay. Go ahead. Can you see the screen and can you hear me? Yeah, it's good. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Just one second. Just make it full screen, please, doctor. Yes, yes, that's what I'm trying to do that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Dr. Abdullah Sharm, organizer of the meeting, and very importantly, uh, some of the attendees Actually, there are some of them are out of Saudi Arabia. I can see them. It's late night and they're still waiting. So my role in this challenging case is further challenging to, to talk about the radiation oncology role uh, for, for these adenocarcinoma bladder. So I will talk about introduction. I will skip most of it because I think it's well explained uh, better than me before by the other speakers, Dr. Amin, uh, Dr. Abdullah Sharm, and uh, Dr. Bassam. 
And then I'll talk about the radiation part of the treatment, and then I'll do conclusion. So this part I'll move forward. Um, uh, we being discussed all of them um, almost. The only thing is they are mostly invasive uh, and they're higher stage and therefore prognosis is not the best. So I move to the treatment. So treatment, we know that the radical surgery is a standard. Dr. Bassam have already mentioned. So that didn't change. It's a rare tumor. We would uh, be, be very difficult uh, to get all the um, uh, two studies in this area to explore it more, whether new adjuvant chemo is good or not, and what can we do more. But radical surgery, we leave it as the standard. And then I move on to a very, very important um, topic today, uh, which is actually the adjuvant uh, treatment. So adjuvant treatment in this uh, setup is the, is the one which I really, really, really want to discuss. If you look at this case, it's a very interesting case. And in this case, uh, patient didn't receive the adjuvant radiation treatment. Uh, so uh, the how we know the role is a rare tumor. But anyway, we know that from the pattern of failure, that after radical surgery, and it was validated by the phase two trials, and it shows that the pattern of recurrence in, is local and also regional lymph nodes. So cystectomy bed and uh, also the lymph node in the pelvis um, are the one which we come to know. And there are different ways, whether positive margin or not. Uh, so based on few factors that um, radical treatment is actually, uh, sorry, the adjuvant treatment has a role. Um, so the slide is frozen. Can it? Just uh, um, try to unshare your screen and share it one more time again, please. Okay, sure. Okay. And I think still the same issue. Can you see screen moving or no, is that? And yeah, okay, it's moving now. Okay, sorry about that. So anyway, so even though adjuvant radiation is controversial, but not so much in this area, um, you know, the most data we get from the endemic region where the cystosomiasis is common, and they not only have the squamous cell carcinoma, but also the adenocarcinoma. And I doubt that we can get more data than, than, uh, than them uh, from NCI of the Egypt. Uh, so anyway, um, also there are US, uh, um, you know, the, uh, there is US CR data they publish. So very interesting, the controversial is because Egypt is saying that there is benefit of radiation treatment. You can see five-year disease-free survival 61% versus 37% if we have given the adjuvant radiation treatment. Um, and, the, and, and, and the National Cancer Database from US did not show any benefit. So in my view, my own opinion, uh, there are two different diseases. One is in the endemic with the, with the cystosomiasis relation and the other one is not. And I can see that, you know, why they, they have different results. So uh, they did, an, uh, North America did an RGGU001 study that closed early because of the poor accrual. So what they were giving the 50 gray in 25 fraction adjuvant radiation after radical uh, surgery, whatever, um, whatever the data they collected, they still submitted that. And we can see there is a trend toward the benefit of adjuvant radiation and also the increase in toxicity. So Dr. Bassam have uh, shown the, uh, this picture, similar picture, which I am showing now. I should give him some honorary uh, radiation oncology certification because this is very important for me. So the main limiting factor for radiation in these cases are the small bowel, which you see just above um, the, the bladder. And especially after cystectomy, this, this all fall down in there. And then for the, um, for the purpose of radiation treatment, we treat the cystectomy bed and also the pelvis and you know the, so the small bowel toxicity is the one which limit our radiation. And the question of benefit or no benefit of radiation is more due to the toxicity of this radiation. So anyway, the indications they chose was anyone with non-urothelial variant, which is this one, adenocarcinoma. And also they look into PT3, 4, um, if it is node negative or anyone with node positive um, and the positive margin. These are the risk factors. So even urothelial and non-urothelial or guru was, was bunched in here, but especially if it is adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, then it was given adjuvant radiation treatment. 
Um, the only precaution, as I said to you about small bowel is issue and or if we make a neobladder for these patients. So the toxicity is the limiting factor. Um, we don't have much doubt about the benefit of uh, adjuvant radiation in this case. So um, this limitation mainly because the studies are slightly older and the radiation technology have actually have enormously moved forward. So if you look at the, in the old days, if you look at the top two slide, the top two pictures, they're showing anterior view of the pelvic treatment and we draw the target. And you see lots of area in between is not target, but we are, we are giving radiation in a box technique. We call it four field box technique where the radiation come from two lateral portals and one for, for front and one back. And you can see the third picture, which is on the corner on, on the bottom, which shows the radiation dose delivery. So treat the entire pelvis, which include the small bowel, which is not needed. And we need only the peripheries where the lymph nodes are. But with the, in, with the modern technique where we draw the conformal volumes, uh, just draw the volume where we want to treat as target, and we use IMRT technique, and then we do daily cone beam CT, like do a quick CT scan before treatment to adjust where the treatment delivery will be. You can see the isodose looks so different. We have the small bowel, the, so the high dose region is only limited to our target, which are the lymph node in this case, in this slice. Of course, there's a 3D view, which we don't have it in here, but you can see how nicely we can avoid the small bowel in the IMRT technique. So that is one of the important thing. Now we don't have newer study um, uh, with, with the, these techniques and which, which we can actually, the number of cases I've seen here is interesting that we can sit down together as a urology group and look into some studies for adjuvant radiation. Now this is, um, uh, Dr. Bassam have presented, uh, I always have confusion with many MAB, you know, the new and newer MAB is keep coming and new molecular uh, targets are coming and I cannot keep up with that. I can remember my radiation oncology machine, whether tomotherapy or cyber knife or LENAC, but you know, this is too much for me. So I'm just uh, showing this slide for you that in future, they're talking about that, okay, how about for adjuvant radiation, uh, we do by the novel risk stratification factor and take the molecular uh, stuff into that. So I leave it because we don't have much data on that. So that, so the main, so main thing I would say after radical surgery, adjuvant radiation is very, very important for all adenocarcinoma, also squamous cell carcinoma and urothelial carcinoma, they are node positive and also T3, T4 disease. So um, uh, you uh, look forward for our um, surgeons that after surgery, if they can refer those patients to us. I'm coming to try modality treatment with the plus or minus uh, salvage cystectomy. So this, this I'm talking about the reason uh, we don't have uh, much data in this area, of course, for adenocarcinoma specifically, and I'm extrapolating mostly from urothelial cancer. So in case if the patient um, uh, uh, is presented to us, which is not you know, unfit for surgery for any reason, or patient don't want to have surgery at any cost, then we can come up with, um, discuss the patient tumor board and come up with a teamwork that you know, uh, the surgeon can do maximal visual TURBT and we can bring the concurrent chemo radiation treatment, radiation oncologists and uh, medical oncologists. And if you look at that, these three people, one is surgeon, the red color I pick because surgeon obviously red, they play with the blood. I like the blue, therefore I pick the radiation oncology blue and yellow is give to medical oncology for no reasons. It's just because I like the blue, so I keep it for red on. So we can come together. And our aim is mainly to cure patient, not to preserve organ. Yes, organ preservation is another important thing for us but organ preservation is secondary. So we aim for cure. And in this case, uh, in urothelial cancer, we can uh, have the bladder preservation um, for, for the in two thirds of the patient. And one third is still needs salvage surgery afterward, which is challenging after chemo radiation, but still this is an alternative option to the gold standard of radical surgery. So with this, you know, the, uh, we, we use different radiation doses and I just, um, one more picture I show you here at the bladder level where red dose is the higher radiation doses and other the lower doses around in the lymph node, which is prophylactic radiation dose to the lymph nodes. And here using IMRT, how nicely we can spare the rectum from the toxicity. There are uh, some, um, uh, and, and the dose when we treat it as radical uh, treatment, then we go up to 66 gray instead of 50 gray. Uh, and there are some side effects of radiation, but they are quite tolerable apart from the bladder effects. If some get severe fibrosis, then they may have to go for surgery for that reason, but it's usually tolerable. 
So with that, I'll come to the conclusion to for the for the time um, you know also limit. So this adenocarcinoma we all know it's a rare disease, poor outcome. Interestingly, poor outcome stage by stage no, stage by stage is comparable to urothelia. The problem is it present at the higher stage, yeah, and therefore the outcome is not that good. And also we don't have established treatment protocols uh, compared to urothelial cancer, and that's maybe contributing to poor outcome for this patient. Um, uh, however, the surgery is the primary treatment. Adjuvant radiation should be considered in post-op cases, especially this patient. I would definitely offer the adjuvant radiation treatment. Uh, Trimodality treat treatment approach, I'll just keep it for the patient who cannot have the surgery for any reason. But as Dr. Bassam already mentioned, uh, that the, the surgery is the gold standard for this. Uh, not least, last but not the least, that palliative radiation has a role in case if patient is not uh, cannot have radical treatment for any reason, we can help them uh, for palliation of symptom, exact, ex especially the hematuria, which is very common and small doses of radiation can control hematuria and also pain or other symptoms for palliation. So with this, I end my talk and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Nadim. Uh, thank you very much. Um, since I'm not expert in GU, um, um, I'll leave um, the discussion with Abdullah Shur if he wants to um, to start the discussion. Um, we have um, in the Q&A, uh, we have one question for you, Dr. Nadim, which is talking about, um, I lost it here, about the dose of radiation. Um, is it different dose in sight between urethelial or adenocarcinoma? Uh, no, actually, the doses are similar. So when we do adjuvant radiation, we go up to 50 gray in, in 25 to 28 fraction. And also when we do uh, concurrent uh, chemo radiation as a radical treatment, trimodality approach, then uh, we go for um, the higher doses to the full like urothelia. So there's no difference in the doses in my view. Uh, Dr. Nadim, it seems that you're very uh, public. All the questions for you. One question oh. here. Okay. <laughs> it's um, if the patient to start chemo radiation followed by surgery, then adjuvant salvage chemotherapy. And the outcome would be different? Yes, it's a very, very good question. Actually, to be honest, I have to be honestly admit the surgeon do better role than the radiation oncology, even though uh, we have lots of questions of them, patient selection and other objections. But literature is so far showing that radiation, if we do upfront surgery, and then we go for adjuvant radiation um, if needed, um, is, is literature showing better, better outcome? If we go for radical chemo radiation, we preserve the organ, but when they fail, not all of them is salvageable by surgery only. So some portion, maybe about 5%, we may lose in that, in that game to, to preserve the organ. But there are claims from us radiation oncologists, we say that you know surgeons select the best patient for them and give the bad one for us, and that's how our outcome is a little bit poorer. The surgeon, the only surgeon. Yes. Um, <laughs> Any comment from the medical oncologist, Bassam Abdullah? So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ashwag. Uh, uh, actually, it was an, an excellent discussion today with a very rare case. So, uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Amin Tijani, while he's in, uh, our colleague in medical oncology, National Guard, how do you like to approach a patient who's coming to your clinic with locally advanced uh, bladder uh, cancer, pathology confirmed adenocarcinoma? What, what's your approach? I know there is nothing true and nothing false. Everything is, can be done for this uh, category of patients. But I'd like to hear your experience. I, I mean, what do you think about this? And then we'll, we'll okay. hear from Dr. Bassam okay. Masleiman. What's his advice okay. about this? Okay, first of all, thank you, Dr. Sharm and, and the other speakers, Dr. Bassam and Dr. Mohammed Amin, Dr. Nadim, for this excellent and informative presentations. And uh, as you know, Dr. Abdullah, this is a primary adenocarcinoma of the urinary bladder is rare, and usually it is an aggressive disease. Uh, we, we did not have good experience with that. Actually, I have only one case following with us, and, and he came after he did surgery, like after, and even they referred him late, like more than nine months. But uh, as you know, there is no standard. 
there is no standard of care to give new adjuvant or adjuvant because most of these cases are, are excluded from, from the big trials of urethelial cancer. Um, to give new adjuvant or adjuvant, uh, no data for that. I think surgery will be, will, will be, will be enough. But those cases need to be discussed uh, individually, case by case, in, in a tumor board to consider to give uh, radiation or to give chemotherapy. Uh, for the metastatic disease, for the metastatic disease, uh, generally also there is no, there is no role. Uh, actually, I have one squamous, squamous cell. Uh, I give him the usual chemo, uh, like cis, cis gym and, and then after that, he received immunotherapy. Uh, in these cases, usually I recommend if, if we can do NGS for those cases to, 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 uh, to have some, some therapy for them. Fair enough. This is fair for, enough. The, for the metastatic. Uh, fair enough. So, Dr. Bassam Basliman, uh, there is a question what chemotherapy you'd like to recommend for adenocarcinoma? And uh, Dr. Rifai, uh, 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 from uh, he's a clinic, clinical oncologist in Islam Abad. He speak about page, uh, for the patient that we uh, we discuss. Uh, he advised to go with the concurrent chemo radiation therapy, followed by surgery, then adjuvant salvage chemotherapy. Uh, he think it will be a good options. So, Dr. Bassam and Dr. Nadim, what do you think about this? I mean. Uh, to go with concurrent chemo at first, then go for surgery, then go with adjuvant salvage chemotherapy and the advice for gym cis platinum chemotherapy. What's your advice, Dr. Bassam Basleman, about this comment from our colleague in Pakistan? Uh, yeah. And uh, then Dr. Nadim. Yeah, for uh, localized disease, uh, we didn't have, as Dr. Nadim also mentioned, it, we didn't have any clear evidence about the role of. Uh, uh, the role of uh, co concurrent chemo radiation in non urethelial cancer, especially adenocarcinoma. So uh, I, I will still push, uh, considering for the patient and recommend for the patient for going for surgery, upfront surgery. Uh, for, uh, yeah, for, and, and, and trying to avoid the concurrent chemo radiation, we don't have that. Uh, the patient still want to preserve the bladder uh, it will be the second, uh, second uh, option, but it's not the, the optimal one, I think, for me. Fair enough. So, Dr. Uh, Bassam Basleman, then we'll come for Dr. Nadim. Yes. Dr. So Bassam, I, uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Sorry, Nadim, go please, go ahead. Okay. So, I echo the, Dr. Bassam's point, you know, that it is uh, still at this time point, and I don't know when we get the data because of rare cancer, that I would also push for a radical cystectomy for non-urethelial and then go for adjuvant radiation, which is, I will be keep highlighting. My situation is like a deer on the wall. If you see in the back, if you can see in my video, this is the deer from Canada, actually, oh, waiting good. for the patient after adjuvant radiation. So this is Canadian deer in Saudi Arabia. So I'm waiting for the patient for adjuvant radiation after surgery. So I will Fair push enough. for surgery up front. Thank you. Fair enough. So Dr. Bassam, uh, uh, the professor Jazia, he asked a very uh, excellent questions about the role of MSI. Shall we send an MSI for this patient? And another question, shall we send for EGFR? I mean, uh, like what's like, like lung cancer, for example, EGFR mutations. You think, do we know any idea about this at the meantime? Yeah, for the, uh, the MSI, still, uh, we know for arcal carcinoma, which is behaving as a colon cancer here, we know that the percentage of MSIs is almost 20% or 15% is almost the same as we can see in the colon cancer. Uh, but still, we don't have uh, a clear evidence that there is a, a benefit from using immune therapy in adenocarcinoma or alcal carcinoma even. So uh, for other for the HFR, um, I, I want one, uh, but isn't one case report about using the cetuximab who patient who has HFR uh, uh, wild. Uh, and it, it's, uh, the cetuximab was uh, showing that there is a, uh, a durable response reaching around eight months. Uh, it's, uh, it's also behaving as a colon cancer, as I mentioned before. So this is for alcohol carcinoma. For adenocarcinoma, other than chemotherapy, uh, it's still that we have to wait for uh, 
uh, clinical trial, even the clinical trial, uh, running clinical trial and this rare variant, rare cancer is very difficult. Yes, agree. So, Dr. Nadim, we have another question again from Dr. Bilal Qurashi uh, from Karachi. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilal, for joining us today. Uh, it is feasible to use the simultaneous integrated pose. Yes, yes. Uh, this is and, a, yeah. yeah, and and, and those category of patients. I mean, the case like we discuss in our uh, case presentations. Yes, yeah. I think this is a very good question, Dr. Bilal. That I agree with you. What you're saying is a newer concept. We start using um, simultaneous integrated boost, and by doing that, we actually reduce the toxicity because a small bowel toxicity is the issue. And if we treat them at one phase with SIB then less doses go to small bowel and other critical structures, sample rectum and other structures. So yes, this uh, SIB will be a good idea. I don't know that what doses we will use and whether any trial running for that, but yes, it's a, it's a good suggestion actually, I would say. Thank you. Good. So uh, I think with this, uh, uh, Dr. Ashwag and Dr. Uh, Prof. Abdurrahman Jaziya, do you like to say any word or do you like to comment, please? Um, Abdullah, would thank you all. Yani, uh, the um, interaction and uh, from the audience, it seemed that GU is very, uh, very popular. Uh, this I'm, I'm trying to tell you since a long time. Allah, yani, I'm going to change my mind. Change my <laughs> and, uh, Dr. Nadim brings us a lot of audience, which is thank for him. Yeah. Um, it was a joy, Dr. Bassam, Dr. Nadim, uh, Dr. Thank you. thank you very much. It was amazing. Very nice case, and I enjoyed myself, although I have yani, little knowledge of you, but I enjoy it as an average oncologist. Um, so I will thank the audience. I thank Marie. Uh, Hamad and Jason for organization and inshallah we'll see you by the end of September on the lung cancer um, so. thank you Ashwag thank you Prof. Abdurrahman Jaziya thank you for the all the attendee and thank you for all the panelists thank yeah, you thank so you much for Lily you. and also for the IFEMS group shukran shukran habaibi jamia thank you thank you very much thank you